Hello, everybody. Uh, it's brilliant to have you with us this evening. I'm really, really um, delighted to welcome you to this evening's session on storytelling, the child and public health. It's part of an incredible week long programme of conversations organised by the brilliant Aoife Monks. Um, we're getting towards the end of that week now. Um, my name is Kira Vaklovic. I'm a professor of children's literature and childhood culture at Queen Mary and I direct Queen Mary's Centre for Childhood Cultures. It's a huge privilege to chair the session this evening. Our panellists individually and together bring a huge and I have to say fairly humbling amount of expertise, decades uh, worth of work in some cases. Um, that work, as we'll be hearing um, about this evening, is nicely varied in uh, form and in content and in terms of where it has and still is taking place. But it's all united by an interest in and focus on children. So it's an opportunity for us um, as panellists to compare notes a little bit, uh, to uh, meet each other again in some instances. Um, and to share our own stories. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce everybody and I'll ask um, each person just to say where they are um, and then if desired, uh, with whom. <laughs> There's a strong possibility, at least in my case, of um, both child and pet cameos. Um, so in my case, I'm um, joining you from East London uh, with two children and a cat uh, in the background any or all of whom are liable to make appearances and or see fit to turn the computer off altogether. So if I disappear, then blame one or other of them. So um, first of all, I would like to introduce, uh, we're just gonna go around um, the panel. I'm going to introduce, first of all, Professor Fran Bolquill, who is Professor of Cancer Biology in the School of Medicine and Dentistry at Queen Mary. And she's also the director of the Center of the Cell. So hi, Fran. Hello everybody. Well, I'm joining you from EC1, just by the Old Street roundabout. And while we're talking about literature, my neighbours are very quiet and they're very well behaved. So my neighbours are uh, William Blake, John Bunyan um, and Daniel Defoe. So if you know, that will tell you where I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking from. <laughs> Dead, dead people. Right. Good. Yeah. Nice, nice and quiet. Yeah, that's brilliant. So, well, at least we won't be disturbed by them, or at least hopefully not. That hasn't been scheduled in any case. No, 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 no. <laughs> brilliant. Lovely to see you, Fran. Um, and now um, over to Roz. Roz Paul, who is the Artistic Director of Seen and Heard Children's Theatre Charity, which is based in North London. So it, she herself is possibly joining us from North London too. Um, I'm not actually, yeah, Seen and Heard's based in Camden, um, but I'm actually in St Albans, uh, working from home at the moment. Uh, I think everyone is out, apart from Socks the Rescue Cat, she's a Covid bo Corona bonus, re rescued during lockdown, uh, so Socks may be pouring at the door at some point, but apart from that, I think we should be undisturbed. <laughs> lovely, lovely to have you with us, Ros, thank you. Um, and then we also have with us um, Dr. Tina Chowdhury, who is Senior Lecturer in Regenerative Medicine in the School of Engineering and Material Science at Queen Mary. Hi, Tina. Hi, everybody. Um, I have an empty house right now because I'm moving, so my daughters aren't here. The cat, Lily Pussy, isn't here, and you can see behind me, I don't have anything in, in the house right now. So. Very odd experience. Um, I live in Chesham, moving further up the A10. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Hi, Tina. Uh, and then we also have with us uh, Dr. Rachel Bryant Davis, who is a lecturer in comparative literature in the School of Languages, Linguistics and Film at Queen Mary. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Kira. Thank you very much. Um, I am in Cambridge at the moment, and potentially we might get joined by my dogs. Um, but I think they're being bribed with food at the moment. Um, if you wanted to see them later, I can always bribe them. My students always <laughs> ask for it. We'll have to have like a poll or something. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. And finally, um, we're joined by Dr. Lucy Glasheen, who is an honorary research fellow in the School of Languages, Linguistics and Film at Queen Mary. Hi, 
Lucy. Hi, hi, Kira. Thanks. Um, I'm speaking from East London, very close to Bethnal Green Station, for those of you who know East London. Um, and I'm mostly joined by several houseplants today. Here we go. Hopefully, relatively quiet. Brilliant. OK, thank you, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Um, and just to say to audience members, we'd be really, really, um, be really keen to um, have your questions. So if you'd like to put those into the chat um, or into the Q&A, then that will be brilliant all the way through. And we'll, we'll hopefully come back to them at, at different points during um, during the evening uh, and possibly also at the end. So. I'm going to hand over straight away to um, Fran um, and um, I just wonder Fran if you could give us a brief overview of your work with and for children particularly the, the work that engaged with questions of public health. Okay well thanks very much and thanks for inviting me Mark. I always absolutely love to talk about children, children's books and um, other work with children. Um, uh, also, there are uh, three images that uh, I think somebody might put up that I can talk to. Um, my work on, I suppose, uh, biomedical science and public health with children began with my own children uh, when they were about two and six. Um, when I work with cells, I, I, you know, the thing I really love is cells. And so I thought I'd go down to Waterstones and get them a book on cells because cells are really, really uh, such exciting and wonderful things. And there's so many stories about them. And the only one I could find was a book by the late Claire Rayner, she wasn't late at the time, called The Body Book. And there was one tiny mention on one page of cells as gray jelly-like things with a hard bit in the middle called the nucleus. Well, I did feel very strongly that that was wrong. And so I started trying to um, redeem that by uh, writing some books on cells. And I'd always enjoyed writing. And I was very fortunate to um, team up with a graphic designer called Mitt Rolf and um, cut a very long story short, we ended up doing a whole series of books. And these are uh, some of the, not so latest, but these are about the last ones we did that are still available um, from Cold Spring Harbor Press. Um, and if you can just switch to the next slide, if we're talking about public health, then um, uh, I guess about 10 years or so ago now, more than that probably, um, I was contacted out of the blue by one of my scientific heroes, uh, Professor Simon Gordon uh, from Oxford University, who is South African uh, by birth and, and um, who was working a lot at the University of Cape Town at the time. He's an immunologist and infectious disease expert. And he phoned me up and said, Fran, I love your books for children on cell biology and molecular biology. Would you do one on HIV AIDS for the children of Africa? So that was terribly exciting. And so what we did was we, I said, well, I can't, I'm a white middle-aged woman. I have, I don't know about the HIV AIDS epidemic. I don't know what the children feel. And so we actually went out to South Africa, to Matuba Tuba, and indeed traveled around Africa, myself, um, Mick Rolf, and um, my 16 year old son, actually. Um, and we spoke to the children and said, if you were going to, we, we're doing a book on HIV AIDS for the children of the world, would you, uh, what would you like in it? And from that, we did a book, we took it back, and um, then we revised it with input from the children. And in fact, this is the latest one, and the draw many of the drawings were done by the children uh, from the townships, you know, from the squatter uh, camps, um, but with very high quality pens and paper. So, uh, and I believe uh, the book is still used with teaching materials and a poster in Africa. And then finally, um, next, if you can go to the next slide, when I joined Queen Mary, um, I became involved um, 
with an idea to have a public engagement space within the to be built Blizzard Institute and then began really turning children's books into 3D. And so Centre of the Cell was born, um, it's now 11 years old. Um, we now have two uh, public engagement spaces, STEM pod, which you can vaguely see inside the building on the left and neuron pod in all its glory outside that lights up the Whitechapel streets. And we've now had 210 about thousand participants. And this is again, really all about public health, our top level messages, when you're ill, your cells have gone wrong. People here and all around the world are trying to find ways to make cells better and you can help keep yourself healthy. And everything we do actually sort of comes out from that. Um, and we also help uh, specific public health projects such as Deans and Health and uh, Chill Childhood Health in London and Luton. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, brilliantly. And actually one of my questions was going to be to you, Fran, about sort of whether there was a storytelling element in the centre of the cell. And it sounds like that really was even from the very beginning, kind of how you had conceived of it. Oh, I think so. I mean, what I learned from the first children's books, where I, I really just based it on my own kids and what I thought they'd like. Incidentally, neither of them had gone into medicine or science. They both work in finance, but that's beside the point. I, the next generation, there's three of them, so I'm hopeful for them. Um, uh, th that I found, you know, science fact is so much more strange and amazing than science fiction. And so in everything I've done, in everything we do at Centre of the Cell, we try and have a narrative. And I think it's really, really important, that narrative. It strikes me just hearing you speak about that actually, Fran, and I'm sure I probably mentioned this when we exchanged before, but and thinking sort of further along um, the line in the panelists for this evening about the kind of historical dimension to this and the fact of the kind of really long history actually of um, using science um, and sort of capturing those strange and amazing stories um, for children. So, you know, with things like Jules Verne back in the day and um, yeah. that it, yeah. it's, it's such a sort of um, rich area and, and still obviously really vibrant. Um, but I suppose that it's kind of like, I can't quite imagine Jules hanging out and, and like going to find out what the children wanted at the time. I think I yeah, yeah, yeah. had quite a strong sense, but it's, it's you know, that um, what you were talking about, about actually consulting and how important children were in, in the kind of creation of these works. And, and still are at Centre of the Cell. You know, we, we always start with what is our target audience and, you know, some what, we, what now I think you call front end evaluation. But I mean, even in the, the case of the, the AIDS book, um, what we learned going back, because the artists had drawn this really amazing, spooky, scary virus, AIDS virus on the front cover, and it scared the kids. They'd had nightmares. You well, know. That's interesting in the context of sort of contemporary viruses. Yes, and that's that why I don't think I'd be interested in doing a book on the pandemic at the moment. It's too fresh. We don't know how it's going to go. And I think the kids are angry about it, you know, but I wouldn't do it unless I'd spoken to loads and loads of kids and their parents and teachers. That's interesting. Yeah. So I suppose because in a way um, we'll come back to this from some of the work that um, Lucy's been doing, um, what you sort of did took so much time, I guess, didn't it? That you took the time to go and ask and find out and that that yeah. then fed into um, fed into the, the works that you were able to produce. Whereas what's sort of happened over the last year is that so much has been produced incredibly rapidly. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, think, I think that that can be useful as well, but the kind of work that I do and we do say in Centre of the Cell or in the books, I mean, the things we are doing at Centre of the Cell is that some of our science shows and workshops we're putting in a module. 
So, and also, by the way, if anyone's interested, we do have coronaviruses for sale in the centre of the shop soon, large ones. They're very, very nice, um, uh, cuddly ones. Um, uh, so I think, and, and so that's very much what, what we would do. But I do think that for the kind of work that we do, it would be much more when we can look back on it. Um, I don't feel that we're equipped or have got the expertise to do anything now. That's my view about it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that mention actually of, of shows and showing kind of brings us nicely to, um, to Roz. And um, I'd like to hand over to her now, if possible, um, who's going to tell us about her work with children in quite a different setting to um, the centre of the cell. Um, and I think we're going to begin with a film, aren't we, Roz, just to give us an overview of the work of, of Seen and Heard. Yeah, absolutely. If we can show the film, which uh, gives, gives that overview, and then I can explain a bit more. Seen and Heard is unique. There is no other project like it in Britain. It uses theatre as a tool. The productions that we create are almost a byproduct, a brilliant, amazing, wonderful, beautiful, artistic byproduct of the heart of the work, which is to mentor children, to boost their self-esteem, to raise their aspirations. Summer's Town is this extraordinary pocket of London, just behind um, Euston Station. Lots of diversity, lots of difference. We have 25 spoken languages in our school, children whose antecedents from five different continents. But um, what most have in common is poverty. The heart of Seen and Heard is that children's voices come out of adult mouths, giving those children's voices credence and value and a public platform for them to say whatever they want to say. And the way that we do it is that the children come on playwriting courses, working one-on-one -on -one with volunteer theatre professionals, actors, writers and directors. And Sandy said, I was brought here by an ordinary girl from Windsor. Connective says. Yeah, connective. Yeah, it says, it's all right. Have a think about what you want your audience to feel. Do they? Do you want them to go, ah? Oh, do you want them to go, oh? Do you want them to go, oh? Any questions? You are all doing extremely well. Focus and concentrate, because this is it. We finish them today. You just remind me of my ex-girlfriend, Mary Ann. Why did your girlfriend dump you or something? I'm Jimmy Stillmore, a platypus. I'm the coolest kid in the block. Don't ask a silly question. Yeah, yeah, she did dump me. <laughs> Brilliant, funny. Should be five star. If it's not, I'll blame the director. The, the best bit is just turning and watching the children, watching their play has been fantastic. Very embarrassed, but very, 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 very chuffed. You've made me a million times happy. We just need to go across the busiest road in our borough to go to my house. <laughs> she didn't get the answer right. The answer was that you can mix a combinator with a Hong Balanino. <laughs> you knew that, <laughs> didn't you? When they take their bows after seeing the production, a sense of pride of what they've achieved is just magical. I was really emotional and but I really appreciated the audience giving me the applause and making me feel happy about the fact that I did a brilliant story. And they went to my mum and said, your son is very talented. David has enjoyed seeing and heard. He comes on talking about it. Look forward for every session to be here and working with all the staff of seeing and heard. Well, it kind of helps you build up your self-esteem and confidence. But it's also somewhere to go, like, because in the area there's nothing really to do. So coming here, like, gives you something to do and it's fun. I got to socialise with new people and take part in writing plays because I hadn't done that in school. And also see my plays come to life, like, see people acting my plays as well. My colour was really beautiful. I should be near Windsor. 
Because uh, I'm a beach from Windsor. <laughs> I'm part of three of them, all of them. They did well. Nadia, <laughs> Hannah, Elijah, Emmanuel, Chloe, David, Sharon, Rosie, Tessie. Our main aim is to make a lasting and profound difference, to show them there are alternative lives. Uh, to thank all of you for coming and sharing in these children's work. To really help children find their path in society and for it to be a good path and a healthy and a happy path. When I saw my play I performed, it was amazing and I never thought I could do something like this before. Well done. I'm so proud. <laughs> and I say softball! softball! <laughs> 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 Okay, are we going to get some? Lovely. 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 Thank you. Sorry, it was a little bit clunky, um, but hopefully you got the idea. Oh, that's brilliant, um, um, Roz. It's so inspiring and so lovely to see kind of the both the, the sort of reactions of children and, and their parents and it's clearly having sort of a, an impact on, on several generations in fact. Yeah, it's, it's, it, and we worked with, we work with whole families so we work with all the siblings within a family um, in an attempt to really have that sort of profound longer term impact. Um, but also, of course, our children, as you can gather, our children are encouraged to write whatever they want. So there are no, the only rule is there are no human characters. So all of the characters are animals, objects and objects of nature. And consequently, we get lots of illnesses and diseases because children write whatever's in, in the news right now, whatever's in their minds, whatever they want to write about. Um, so I was looking back over the history and we've had, um, we've had a number of flu coughs, a flu virus, an infected toenail. Uh, we've had agonizing pain and a margarita pizza who is suffering, suffering from a soft cold. Um, but uh, one character, I've got a few quotes for you from some text that, because the, we don't change or edit the children's words in any way. So the actors must, must speak exactly as written. Uh, and so Raphael, who was an infection, uh, said to Samantha, a, a lemon tea bag, I infect people in the surgery room, which is where I live, with my sister and allergy. Unfortunately, I live in England, which is dangerous for me because they always cure infections with injections. Uh, and so whatever's happening, uh, as I say, at the time in the news, so we had a, a little spate of swine flu uh, in sort of 2009, 2010, there was a character that was swine flu hand gel and one that was swine flu on a hyena. Uh, but one of the most brilliant disease characters I think we've ever had was um, diabetes. And uh, he was very clear about his role in society. He says, uh, diabetes is when you eat a lot of sugar and then you get like a heart attack or something and it could kill you. And I am the diabetes, my name is Deadly Danny. I touch people and then you get a shock and you die with diabetes. So stop eating lots of sugar or I'll have to kill you. Um, wow, it's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> really very, very clear. Um, a, a character that really resonated with me was um, not a disease, but an illness. He was a spiky rubber, rubber bouncer ball, but he'd had a, a nasty accident at work. He'd fallen down a lift shaft and he'd broken his back and he couldn't work or walk anymore. And that is precisely what had happened to this child's dad. Uh, I don't know that he fell down a lift shaft, but he had a very nasty accident at work, which damaged his back and he could no longer work or walk properly. Um, and what was very beautiful about this piece was that the child was then able to write a happy ending, which he did. So the, the, the bouncy rubber ball, what he wanted most in the world was to extinct poverty. And the way he did this was to set up a charity and do his bouncing and raise lots of money. So it was really, really very sweet. Um, Towards the end, no, towards the start of 2020 in February, before we really knew what was happening, we already had a character created that was coronavirus. It was called Rambashi. And um, the child wrote this in early February, really when it was sort of not quite in our consciousness so much, but clearly was in hers. 
um, and the character introduces himself. He says, I'm just a coronavirus, don't judge me. I come from a good family. My dad was a hand that didn't wash itself. My mom was a sneeze. No parents is perfect. Mine committed suicide. They couldn't take it anymore. Uh, amazingly, of course, we had to, well, not amazingly, but that, that character didn't make it onto the stage because we had to cancel the show. How um, old was the, was the writer of that, of that character, Ros? She was 10. Wow, so, I mean, that's very clearly understood that. Really clear, that on what time. Very clearly had yeah. understood the key messages. Absolutely. Already. Already, I mean, that's very, yeah, wow. It's quite, it's quite extraordinary. So with this past year, of course, we've not been able to run those courses that lead into productions. And consequently, we've, at the request of the primary schools we work with, we've gone into primary school and we've created a kind of hybrid version of what we do, which is we've been working, creating characters, but we worked alongside one of our long-term friends, Karis Williams, who is a drama therapist, to create kind of hybrid, a fusion of scene and heard and drama therapy where We've been working with all the year groups in primary school from year two to six, trying to help them process what's happened over the past year, how they feel, what it's been like, um, and to remind them about play and a sense of play, because so many of them have been locked up in their flats and not gone out and not walked and not. So um, we've we've done two terms of that. We're on another term of that now. And the characters are amazing. I've got just a couple of little examples for you. Uh, that year, year two, teeny year twos, created um, one character was a door who was very afraid of coronavirus. So what he did was he locked the door to keep it out. Um, and he met um, an Apple iPhone who was having an awful time because he was a touch screen and he got touched and he got coronavirus. Uh, and all he wants really is to be clean. Um, and there was a toucan who, can't go flying, he can't visit his friends, he can't do any shopping and really wants to go to Paris, but he knows he can't. So he busies himself writing stories and when he's bored with that, he starts ordering clothes on Amazon. So um, you can see that the work that we do, whatever is in the children's minds or consciousness at the time, just filters through, tumbles out really into the characters that they create. Um, and at the moment, it's it well the work we're doing in schools is all about lockdown and covid and emerging from that um and yeah coming back to play it strikes me even sort of in 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 pre-covid and then during the covid work that you've been doing there's there's a sort of real sense of kind of absurdity of of these kind of wonderful combinations and kind of collisions of ideas and objects and feelings and yeah. um and I suppose I mean I guess for you as you've been doing this work during in this sort of such strange circumstances that must have all seemed quite fitting somehow yes I think it really has I've um the um being able to go into schools has been such a brilliant thing the school said will you come will you come and I was like well how how does this work and I thought well actually we work, we, we, you know, we talk about animals and objects. So we've had little group discussions and we've talked about what's, what's COVID been like for the animals. Well, some of them have had a great time because it's been quite quiet. So, you know, the hedgehogs haven't got run over and, you know, but maybe the seagulls are a bit fed up. The people aren't eating fish and chips at the beach and so they can't swoop down and nick your fish and chips, your ice cream. All of this helps the children, I think, to process and to think about how they feel and that they're not alone in feeling they can't go somewhere or they can't do something or they can't see their nan. Um, and we've talked a lot about death as well, um, because we, one of the schools we serve, that, that particular community has been very, very uh, badly impacted. There's been a lot of death uh, and children haven't been able to go to the funeral or they haven't been able to do family activities that, you know, where you come together and you, you have rituals where, that help you process. So that's been a, a huge part of what we've been doing. And of course, our approach has, has, has suited this really, really well. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And I wonder whether on that kind of the whole issue of visibility and invisibility it might be a way to um, move into um, or move across to, to Tina's work. And just that sort of idea of, you know, um, being able, Bring it, being able that the fact that children haven't been able to sort of um, to, 
yeah, the invisible, not being able to see what's going on and not being able to go to, to um, funerals and so on or see people is maybe a way of, of, of us moving across to Tina and, and hearing about some of her um, work, which is sort of, you know, we've, we've been talking up until now about um, youngish children, I think. Um, these are really the youngest children. Um, so Tina, would you, um, would you um, tell us a little bit about your work um, with children and, and for their parents? Absolutely, thank you, Kira. Um, so I've been working with young children for a number of years now, particularly the unborn child. And one of the things, one of the hats that I wear at Queen Mary University of London is, 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 is my being able to communicate our research to, the, to, 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 to children, to young people and their parents and their families. And um, for a number of years now, I've been, I've been working with disadvantaged young children um, from really difficult schools, not just from East London, but all across the country. And, and when I meet these young people, these are very young, talented, <laughs> um, young, um, budding scientists, and I, and I, and I talk to them about my, our research um, in biomedical engineering, they, 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 they just look horrified. They're absolutely frightened. <laughs> the word biomedical engineering just sounds completely daunting to them. So we did a number of things to try and break down those barriers and overcome the fears for our, for our, for our young children. And um, I was very keen to, to bring um, our research, to make it more accessible to young minds. And, and the, the young uh, mothers, when they're going through pregnancy, um, this is sort of the area of research I'm very interested in. Uh, we were trying to understand why is it that some mums are able to deliver a baby um, at the right time, um, so and they can have um, these babies grow up to be young, healthy infants, young, healthy children. But in some instances, these young babies uh, are born too early, um, they're born prematurely, and the reason for that is because of the, the fetal membrane tissues, which is a bit like a balloon, it's a bit like a sack, um, which protects the baby during pregnancy, and, and, and something goes wrong with this, this balloon-like structure. For some reason, in some women, that, that structure changes its shape. For some reason, the structure becomes weak and it tears or it pops. And then suddenly, we, the, 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 the baby loses all the amniotic fluid, which is inside um, the balloon-like structure. And the baby has to be born. Um, there's no way the, the mother can carry on with the pregnancy. Um, and, and if she did, then it would it's highly likely that the mum will have an infection and the baby will have an infection and then sadly both will die. So, so this world of healthy pregnancy is an area that I'm very, very interested in. So that's kind of the area of research. But I'm also very, very interested in encouraging our young girls, our young women into understanding the science and the engineering behind that balloon-like structure. Because actually it is a mechanical system. It's a bit like, you know, when you're, when you're blowing up a balloon, all that pressure that's going into the balloon, the, the, the balloon is very stretchy. It's, it's highly, um, you, can, you can keep pulling it and blowing it up. And is it gonna pop? It's never gonna pop. But that's a healthy pregnancy. But for some reason, in some women, the biomechanics of that material, that balloon structure changes. And so we want to, we want to be able to communicate that to, to, our, to our young students. And um, one of the things that I've been exploring with uh, uh, young minds, and, and these are children, very young children, at primary school level. So we're talking about year six children. Um, we've always um, taken some of Fran's centre of the cell, those beautiful cells, we bring them into the, into the classroom, so they've seen lots of your cells, Fran, um, and the idea is to show them these wonderful cells and how they have an impact on maintaining the mechanics, the engineering side of the tissues, the, the engineering of the fetal membrane tissues. Um, and and, and when, we, when we sort of engage our young um, 
children into understanding both the biology and the engineering as these young people grow up and they hit secondary school, they start to think about GCSEs and A-levels, they've heard that word, biomedical engineering. And so this is where, so, you know, I've got some slides somewhere, I'm not quite sure where they are, but if you want to sort of show, show some of these pictures, these are wonderful images just to show you um, the balloon-like structures, um, which is highly compact, there's a lot of pressure inside there, it's a three-dimensional environment, so it's, you know, so mum, she could be doing some yoga, she could be doing some handstands while she's pregnant, she could be on a bicycle. And that balloon structure will be maintained. Um, and that's because of its, its, its mechanical sort of environment. Um, um, and so if you move on to the next slide, um, there's this, can you see this picture of a hole? So this is from a mum who had to deliver her baby prematurely because that hole just didn't heal. It couldn't repair itself. And so all this fluid is coming out of that hole um, and the tissue is weakening around the edges of the hole. And that weakened structure leads to premature rupture of the membrane. So we've been working with charities um, such as Little Heartbeats Charity who are absolutely incredible. And they've been telling our story to the community. So this isn't about just sharing um, stories to young children and young people at schools and colleges. It's also about sharing the stories to mums and dads and to their families. And if you go on to the, to the next slide, I have a little video here. This is a three-dimensional video. This is something that in the laboratory environment, we'll be able to create these wonderful um, videos that allows us to look at how these cells, these wonderful, beautiful cells, how they can move around um, the tissue structure to maintain the health. If you go to the next slide, um, thank you. Um, but those cells, they don't sit there, they kind of move around, they, 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 they change their shape. And, and when things go wrong, remember that hole that I showed you earlier, you can see uh, this particular hole is very brightly coloured, and that's because there's lots of different types of cells all moving around, and they're making their way inside the hole, um, and they're trying to repair that tissue. And we we'll just move to the video. So this video on the next slide is a really nice video because it shows how those cells move within the different layers of, of the tissue where they're trying to fix and repair that hole. So we're going in a loop um, with time. So if we play it again, and we can see it from the top of the structure all the way down to the bottom of the structure. Now, all these sorts of technologies that we're using in the lab is normal to me. It's normal to our research team. It's normal for us within the biomedical engineering world. But when we show these three-dimensional videos, to parents or to mums or to children or young people who are thinking about studying at university, they don't understand what any of this means, which is why we're trying to create a new technology revolution. So this is where we are creating digital resources using immersive storytelling techniques and uh, where we're working with children, we're working with um, young people at schools, and the idea is that our students, so our young people, the children will be working with Queen Mary, University of London students, and together we'll be creating these immersive resources to help share the types of work that we do in our research. And fingers crossed, um, it, will, it will hopefully encourage our young people, especially young girls, Young girls from my sort of ethnicity, I'm, I'm from Bangladesh, um, but I would like to encourage young people to engage in the type of work that we do with environmental engineering because this sort of novelty of um, research is so important. We need young people to understand uh, the motivations of why we work and, ask, and actually why we are developing um, skills 
in the, I like to call it the STEAM disciplines, because it is about the science, the technology, the engineering, the arts, the maths, and the medicine, all of it together to try and create um, these digital um, and produce these sorts of digital technologies. And I think if we can reach young people with immersive storytelling, and if we can reach their families, then we will be able to encourage um, our, uh, our next generation of biomedical engineers. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tina. And I mean, I think you mentioned their beauty and and it is this kind of, you know, you don't have to understand what they are to actually appreciate them aesthetically. They are really incredibly striking um, things. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are beautifully coloured, absolutely gorgeous. And you can sort of pull them out with brightly coloured sort of cells, as they were. All the different bits together and you can map them all out and you can model them and you can actually follow you can follow sort of the physiology um, of what is happening during pregnancy with with whilst mum is going through her day-to-day -day sort of activities i mean it's it's just wonderful the imaging technologies that we have in the lab um, and how we can sort of relate that back to back to the real story behind what is happening during pregnancy. Yeah, that's, it's, it's so wonderful as well to hear about the kind of the, the future orientation of, of what you're doing and sort of thinking about how sort of stories and sort of experiences that are, and even, you know, quite distressing experiences often, it sounds like, can actually be used um, in order to build quite positive kind of lines in into sort of people's individual futures. Absolutely. I mean, what I want to, one of sort of the areas that I'm trying to focus on is to try and help our young people understand our language in the research environment. Because I, I think I think communicating what we do in the research world can be quite daunting. And, and I think we, we you know, to be able to reach out to young people, we need to bring our language to a level that is understood by the young people. Otherwise, we're not going, going to be able to sort of expose our, our budding scientists and our engineers. We're going to lose that talent. What we want to do is attract that talent to help us um, with um, you know, pushing the boundaries of this particular field. Um, I mean, this is all about women's health, child health, and it's also about COVID-19 health. I haven't talked about the impacts of COVID-19 during pregnancy. I haven't talked about the impacts of air pollution during pregnancy. So, so the, you know, how we sort of do our day-to-day -day lives, what we are doing will have an impact um, on fetal health and also child outcomes as well. So there's lots of things, you know, that, with, that in this conversation that we, we are trying to talk about today, so, so I, I hope I hope I've managed to bring this across. Thank you. Absolutely, and and that brings us so nicely into the 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 next project actually that we're going to hear about. Um, because in a way, you know, a it's on COVID, which you just mentioned, um, but also a sort of idea of you know storytelling to inspire kind of future actions and and to try and shape the future. Um, and now we're going to hear about a project which looks at stories um, to help children understand kind of very current events and to, and, and similarly to kind of Rosa's work as well, um, that, and, and actually a, a connection between all of the work that we're hearing about is that the communication of complex, confused, confusing, sometimes terrifying and daunting sort of experiences um, and health and medical matters, but use, using stories. So I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Rachel to tell us more about that project. Thanks, Kara, and thanks everyone. It's been um, so inspiring to hear about all of this work and, and all the connections. And like you say, Kara, um, this project is about the, the storytelling, making sense of um, the developing complex situation. Uh, one of the dogs is going to give this talk for me, apparently. Um, and um, thinking of particularly about using 
mythic narratives, narratives of, of heroes, heroism, um, that might be more familiar um, and that have a, a backstory, a tradition um, that can offer some um, some historical perspectives uh, on a on a developing, confusing situation to, to perhaps offer some perspective or some strategies. So our project is called Childhood Heroes, Storytelling Survival Strategies and Role Models of Resilience to COVID-19 in the UK. Um, it's funded by the British Academy and it's hard to believe now, but a year ago we were writing the proposals for this. Um, so it's uh, a, a much, um, a, a much more, um, I guess, put together in response uh, to COVID-19 than some of the other projects we're hearing about. Um, but we are thinking about ways in which that could be um, developed, taken forward in the future. So it grew organically out of developing research within the Centre for Childhood Cultures. Um, and we're focusing on storytelling, both past and present. And the aim is to mitigate the immediate and longer term educational, social and mental health impacts of COVID-19 and also address the marginalisation of children's voices. Um, and it was prompted by thinking about the pressing needs of children through the pandemic. Um, so we're grounding it in the past in the research that we've been doing, but looking towards um, the future. And there's two interlinked strands to it. Um, one explores historical children's interaction with classical role models um, in early magazines and they forged new communities through distance learning. So um, the format was a, a good way to think about how we can meet the challenges of, of crisis schooling. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, the other strand focuses on creative responses to heroic narratives today in light of COVID-19 and researching the archival and contemporary material together enables us to think about the shifting but also enduring notions of heroism and childhood. Um, so Dr. Lucy Glashine has been producing a series of blog posts um, documenting the ever-growing corpus of COVID-19 children's books and I'll hand over to her now. Great, thanks so much. And I've got some slides um, uh, to show as well. Um, so as Rachel sort of touched on, uh, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of books have been produced for children about or in response to COVID-19. Um, sorry, could I get the slide up? Brilliant, thanks. Um, and many were produced very quickly, published or released in April, May and June 2020. Lots of different people have become involved in creating COVID children's books. This includes international humanitarian health and literacy organisations, charities, academics, uh, healthcare, health professionals, established children's authors and publishers, and a lot of first time authors and illustrators, including children, self-publishing. And a huge number are available in some kind of um, free online or PDF version. So nearly all could be read globally and some are specifically targeted to a global audience. And I think this is worth noting in light of the differences in national public health measures, communications and um, sometimes scientific interpretation. There's much that could be said about the way in which these texts communicate about the disease itself, which many of the people here would be um, sort of more um, qualified to comment on than me. Uh, but what, what I've been focusing on is how these narratives imagine and position the child in relation to public health and society. And I'm thinking here about the child protagonists or characters and the child readers. And thinking through possible implications for both living with and moving beyond pandemic restrictions. So that kind of future aspect that we've been looking at. Um, and the scale and variety of the corpus is actually really valuable for kind of getting a sense of differences and uh, shared understandings. So I'd just like to briefly highlight a couple of important th narrative themes and issues. Um, I've been really surprised at the number of visual and textual references to superheroes. There are some examples of this in relation to healthcare workers and so-called key workers, which is kind of in line with what we've been seeing in the UK more, more generally. Uh, but there are also many examples of children temporarily taking on the role of superhero. Casting children as superheroes suggests they can have an active and powerful role in public health, 
This is in contrast with the way that they were portrayed in the UK media in relation to the pandemic, where we've often seen an absence of children from public health messaging and debates. Um, and where they have appeared, they've often appeared as, or primarily appeared as either a victim or a threat. So scholars of childhood studies have pointed out that this is common dualistic thinking um, about children and have, have looked at the ways that that's classed, racialized, gendered and aged. Um, we've seen children, particularly teenagers, viewed as spreaders of disease and or as victims of public health measures in terms of educational development and mental health. Portraying children as superheroes then suggests instead that they can be have, play a positive protective role and it gives their compliance with public health measures meaning. Next slide. However, the meanings attached to superhero are complex, ill-defined, and sometimes can be counterproductive in helping children understand and mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Perhaps surprisingly, many narratives fail to capitalise on the idea that the superhero is a protector of the community or society. Um, the image on the right there is an exception. So perhaps, uh, sorry, so focusing on the hero as a special individual uh, distances the child from others and may add to, add to feelings of isolation, perhaps running counter to public health principles and raises questions about the sort of society that we want to see post restrictions. Narrative form and content can though be used to imagine and sustain connections with others. And the left hand image is an example of this. The story puts a number of different child characters with different experiences in conversation with one another and directions encourage adults and children to read uh, the story together um, and promotes collaboration. And as Rachel mentioned, mine and her historical research has also looked at how magazines can create or form remote and local communities. Uh, slide three. So another potentially worrying trend that has emerged is the drive for stories to be resolved positively and often through positivity. And I think this links to sort of the, the magic superpowers of the superhero. So texts such as The Big Thing, which you can see on the screen there, attempt to explore children's frustrations and worries. Um, but also find a way to help them within the limit of the short story. Many stories do this through encouraging children to look for or celebrate positive aspects of their experience. And children are also praised for keeping our spirits up. And I think this is of concern for three reasons. Um, it makes assumptions about the child reader's experiences and, for instance, access. Um, and as Ros was, was talking about, you know, um, there, there's an expectation here that children aren't grieving, actually, in, in many of these books. So um, that's sort of, yeah, make, making those kinds of assumptions about their experiences. It can promote some problematic ideas, such as ecofascism and it risks trivialising children's emotional responses. Um, so I'll just end by saying I think it's important to look at the work that public health storytelling does in constructing the subject and the public and kind of world. And to think about content form and context. Um, but, and I'll pass back to Rachel to talk more about um, the project Work With Storytime. Thanks, Lucy. Um, could we have the next slides, please? So we've also been producing our own stories in collaboration with Storytime magazine, and it's um, an amazing social enterprise that aims to promote literacy among three to nine year olds. Thanks for the slides. Um, so this is the set of resources that we've produced. Um, and the first one went out in October. And this partnership meant that we could reach across the country and internationally through the magazine's existing readerships and contacts um, moving quickly. So we received the grant in July and we first distributed in October. 
Um, the open access PDFs are still being downloaded, um, but we distributed about a thousand print copies. Um, about 700 went via virtual schools, which are run by local authorities for looked after and previously looked after children. Um, and about 30, 50 to physical schools, um, which could then be shared within class bubbles. And also primary schools were emailed with the option to receive the PDFs on publication rather than having to go and, and find the downloads. Um, so um, that's uh, because it was a, a sort of quickly put together project um, we're still working out the next stages um, so that we can uh, be in line with the, the change in COVID regulations um, but there, there are further plans in the works and you'll notice that the covers um, all illustrate and name ancient Greek and Roman myths and fables that's partly because my research explores how Greco-Roman antiquity was adapted in later contexts. Um, and currently I'm focusing on different children's media between 1850 and 1914. And that includes historical magazines and formats such as board games and puzzles. And it's influenced the interactive content um, of the We're Heroes supplements. And um, I, um, also had uh, thought that using ancient myths and heroes could help children to understand and process some of the ways that the realities were changing around them, um, such as protective equipment, um, similar to heroic equipment, and measures such as infection control. Um, so we produced some activities and prompts that were vetted by a children's psychologist and um, because that's very much outside my expertise I very much wanted to have an expert involved so that teachers and parents could have increased confidence in the combination of myth and the mental health and COVID-19 messaging. At the moment we're in very um, preliminary survey responses but it does look as though um, people have responded very positively to that. So the six, the six issues explore um, PPE, social distancing and armour and equipment, um, fighting infection and uh, contagious acts of kindness. I wanted to put a, a positive spin into issue two. Um, experiences of lockdown and isolation in issue three. Social reintegration, um, processing grief, trauma and familial separations and overcoming adversity with innovation and teamwork and um, particularly thinking about things like the ventilator challenge um, and the development of vaccinations. So this involved some careful editing and tweaking of the stories. We're trying to exploit a historical format as well as a current format um, without importing um, some of the, the difficult aspects of historical content. Um, so for example, the town and country mice um, story used in issue three um, were perfect to explore different experiences of lockdown as might be shared at school um, between children comparing what they were up to. Um, but we wanted to focus on the positive aspects of appreciating um, things like the use of green spaces, whatever shape that might take. Um, rather than encouraging negative comparisons as some versions of the ancient source do. We also tried to include um, women and animals as well as more stereotypical male heroes. Uh, we were working with some existing illustrations um, within the budget so, so that constrained us to some extent. And there was one story that I wrote myself for issue five um, about a, a hero who's abandoned on an island and then he's rescued when his army needs him. Again, it's a difficult myth um, and I was trying to use it as a way to think about the potential difficulties of social reintegration. So um, the supplement format was two stories per 16 page issue. Um, almost all chosen from the archive because um, they were already illustrated, which saved the budget. And then we could plough that into the print distribution for children without access to the internet. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we added some elements. Um, we edited the stories, um, things like pronunciation boxes um, so that that's more accessible, um, information boxes which explained aspects of antiquity that might not be familiar, and also prompts um, to explain or to explore mental health, um, resilience and COVID-19. So for example, the, the power of protection box is thinking about the, um, the items that the goddess is providing over on the left um, and likening that to masks um, 
the, uh, the books on the left, the orange one, um, learning from the legend, thinking about conversational prompts um, that could come out of the legends. Um, so we're trying to encourage creative responses and um, trying to encourage parents and um, teachers uh, conversations between children. And there's also some creative uh, prompts. Um, so there were pages that would help um, with making masks or drawing pictures and that sort of thing. Um, could we have the next slide again, please? So um, we used interactive activity pages to reinforce the same messages in a variety of formats um, and the creative responses to help facilitate emotional processing. This is just a selection of um, the one on the left, the Midas touch, um, showing that we use public health messaging but made into an experiment. So the idea of using something like coffee or glitter um, to show how long washing was needed for. Um, mental health, thinking about um, mix and match of emotions down on the bottom left. And we put on the back cover a, a crossword on each issue um, with an anagram. So in this case, it's a hero. Um, other cases, there were things like health. Um, and that was to, to give some continuity to the series. Um, and if we could have the next slide, please. So the care taken over continuity and the range of activities is a feature of magazines, um, which I've noticed is really powerful. Um, this is from the 19th century. It's a um, encouragement to enter competitions, the rules, regulations, um, and uh, the magazines have been shown to have built communities of shared interest, often around science communication, um, and they help children to overcome isolation in the pre-digital um, pre-easy transport links era and they also supported um, self-education, home learning and playfulness. So it did seem a very suitable format to support pandemic crisis schooling. Um, and onto the last page again please. Um, so we're trying to emphasise the useful aspects of the myth um, while avoiding the problematic ones as much as we can. So a focus on happy endings, um, not shying away totally from, from issues within the stories, um, but aiming to have a resource that didn't need to have adult input um, that could be enjoyed um, by children and be a useful resource without necessarily one-to-one -one input. Um, and I think I will stop there so we've got time for questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. And thank you to everybody. I think what I might do now is to see whether there are questions and comments between our panellists. Um, I could say I've, I've been using my um, my position as chair to be able to add in little bits and pieces, but I'm sure there's, there are comments and questions. I mean, there's one thing that I can certainly sort of think about in terms of taboos and whether there's anything that's off limits um, in, in your work. But maybe, um, first of all, I'll see if anybody wants to comment or ask any questions. Could I um, chip in here? Um, two, two comments, one, one to Ros and one to Tina. Um, I love the I love the idea of using um, objects, animals and things. And I'm fascinated by the fact that disease comes up so much. And I'm assuming you don't choose that. It just happens. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. And it resonates with something, uh, as I said, with Central Cell and with the, certainly with the AIDS books, um, we've always gone to the children first to, you know, to our target audience. And when we first started Center of the Cell, we thought, I thought, we have cells are beautiful, wonderful things. They're so fabulous and everything. And when you go into the school, the kids say, no, we want blood and guts and gore, you know? And so I think I, I was wondering, um, you know, how much does disease come up in pre-COVID times and just generally the kids seem to have a fascination with disease um, and, and maybe, you know, with things like central cell and what you, you do that, that uh, you, we really exploit this. 
Um, and the second comment to Tina, you talk about language. I completely agree with you and we mustn't alienate children, but I have found that children actually love to use big scientific words. If you could, I mean, to teach a child how to say deoxyribonucleic acid so they can go into their classroom the next day and say, teacher, what does DNA stand for? Oh, it's such a, they absolutely love it. So I'd be interested, you know, what your experience is of that. So so those were my two questions for for those for all of them brilliant talks so so oh, you, could, you could try that Fran on mine actually if you'd like <laughs> yes. to. Could, that, could a, that could be an outcome of this session <laughs> but while they're raiding the cupboard um Roz would you like to uh, respond to Fran then we'll go to Tina yes I think that I mean so many different characters come up and we've been doing this for so long that, that mm. certainly diseases and illness and whatever's happening in children's lives, but or whatever's in the news, politicians, we don't have humans. So you will get, you know, you will get David Cameron's cheesecake or you will get <laughs> whatever's in the news. Um, one of my favorites was a burger. This was very topical at the time. She was a cheeseburger and she just went up to the audience at one point and went, I'm really worried I might have horse meat in me because the horse <laughs> meat, so they're just, pick up you know what whatever's going on and, and illness and disease of course is 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 huge in children's lives so actually you've got a whole research project going there about what the children are telling you about yeah. their how i hope you can capture that because i think that could be very useful moving forward to, you know to understand how to help them when hopefully we come out of this. Absolutely. And I think one of the interesting things that we often find is that um, because the children can write whatever they want and there is no there is no sort of restriction on that, that we do get funders, for example, the Francis Crick Institute, who are just down the road from us, who do sometimes give yeah. us a bit of funding as a community organisation, but they say, well, could you go and the welcome as well? Mm. Could you get the children to write a play about science? And I'm like, no. But no, they might no. well do. Yeah. But it will be yeah. Because that's what they wanted to write about. So we've had some incredibly brilliantly sciencey plays, but we didn't mm. know that before we, we applied for the funding. So we couldn't make it happen in that way. And on the whole kind of language, I mean, it's interesting because with the magazines as well and, and giving sort of prompts around pronunciation and trying to kind of facilitate that actually, but not not kind of renaming anybody but keeping it but just help just just I suppose giving that kind of support and confidence and or, or, mm -hmm. or almost I think also what it is is I think and what unites um, a lot of what we've been talking about is a kind of process of translation isn't it it's a kind of m moving things into a different maybe a different register or just kind of yeah so Tina did you want to say something about your experiences of Fa fancy pants language. <laughs> well, so my, my daughters, when they were babies in arms, I used to, you know, put, she'd be sitting right here and I'll be working away on the computer, you know, obsessively with my images and, and the conversation that I would have with my two year olds, who they grew up to be a three and a four, they were talking to me with the words chondrocytes, mechanobiology, P38 like kinase. And the reason why they were able to pick up the language is because I explained to the child what it did, how it worked, what, what, what its purpose was. And so I, I think when, when the girls started going into nursery and, and I was going into the classroom, I realised that by bringing in all those props, so your centre of the cell, cells, Fran, have been <laughs> instrumental in all the demonstrations <laughs> that we've done in the classroom, because they know at the end of the session they're going to get a toy. And it's yeah. Toy. <laughs> so, they, so they go back home to their mummies and their grandparents. They're like, look, here it is. I've got a sperm cell or I've got yeah. a bacterial cell, whatever it is. And, 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 and I think, you know, if you build those sorts of uh, programs, so we, we developed this thing called the bioengineering experience. And it really was mixing the biology, the medicine and the, and the engineering all together. And this was for our year five, year six children. And we brought different types of schools. So the, so the, the really difficult schools where the language, where 
just, just, they just blew their minds away. You know, they came to Queen Mary for a day to be bioengineers. And by the end of that day, after going through the experience, we're just blown away. And then we also had children in that environment who came from private schools who experienced it the best of all the extracurricular and the best of this that, and the other. We brought those different groups together to Queen Mary and it was just like an explosion. So when it came to the science of, and the language and the engineering words, you know, by the end of the day, they'd all go back home and they were talking about it. And the letters, Fran, the number of letters that I would receive, thank you letters coming from the, from the children, from the teachers and the stories. You know, we've, 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 we've taken this collection and we need to publish it. We want to share it because it's just amazing because they truly are inspired. Yeah. And they don't forget. They don't forget yeah. because they're now, some of these kids are, are GCSE A-level now and they're contacting me saying, do you remember that time when I came to Queen Mary? Uh, yeah. And you taught me about the kind of transduction. So yeah, it really does have. We, we have, we have sort of, you know, I have medical students coming in for a mentoring session. And the reason they're a Queen Mary medical student is because they went to Center of the Cell summer school, you know, and the first in their uh, family at university. Uh, we have one, um, one of our part-time medical student explainers who was homeschooled and came to us age 11, um, never been to school never had science, loved it so much, um, and taught a self-science to GCSE, went to sixth form college to A-level, is a medical student with us, and she's a part-time centre of the cell explainer. You know, there, there are all these stories. So, and, and to not, as you're doing, and as we're doing, and not to hide away from the complex language. I think learning, as you say, they must understand what DLC ribonucleic acid is, but with children learning, it gives them enormous confidence. Um, and if they can understand even a little bit about DNA, you know, we do DNA for six-year-olds, um, but even if they just can take away a little bit about DNA, then, you know, DNA I'm sure comes in sometimes to the plays in Seen and Heard as well. As in the Greek fantasies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I just just thinking about all those workshops that my daughters have attended at the centre of the cell, and then your teams come to the school. So we've had back to back workshops in the Hertfordshire schools, which are so different. If you go to Harrow, um, so I'm talking about um, sort of on the other side of the A10. Um, you know, they have a, a BMAT STEM Academy that they've just set up because of, of people like your, you know, the PhD students, the medical students, they're promoting all of these different subjects. And, and I think with STEM ambassadors as well, it's so important that mm. we train our ambassadors so that they have this understanding that actually it's okay to say those big buzzwords. It really is yeah. okay yeah. because the audience if you if you if you talk about it in a way that they understand, they'll get it and they'll yeah. they'll be buzzing about it. And there's so, something very sort of in so it's that kind of a, something. It could be relatively brief, but can be so inspiring and long lasting, and and have that kind of long trajectory it's wonderful to hear and in the same way I think it's clear that our conversation could have a very long trajectory too and I'm very very sorry that I'm afraid we're going to have to call it to a close because there's going to be another conversation right after this one but I would just like to take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists so much and I do look forward to further conversations between us all and um, thank you again for your time this evening. Thank you. Let's hope it's just the beginning. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you, Fran. Thanks, Rachel. Bye -bye. Thank thanks, Tina. Bye -bye, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rose. Oh, and thanks to everyone, to um, Aoife and everyone for setting this up as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.